Village School, and welcome to today's live newscast. Your newscasters are Joe from Mr. Bartholomew's class. And also Sammy from Mr. Bartholomew's class. At this time, we have a very special guest. We are connected with Mr. Talley from NASA. Good morning, good morning, Mr. Talley. Thank you for being a part of our morning newscast. Our school has sent a number of questions we were hoping you could answer for us. That sounds great, Joe. Our first question is from Ashley and Miss Lucas's class. Can you tell us more about your job? Thanks, Ashley. Uh, Ashley, you actually sound like my supervisor. What do you do around here? I'm only kidding. I'm the Digital Learning Network Coordinator, so I'm responsible for the development, yeah. delivery, and production of all live interactive video conferences from the NASA Kennedy Space Center to schools just like yours all across the country. I do about 300 video conferences a year with schools. Uh, I really enjoy my job. My background is classroom teacher. I now have a master's degree in aerospace education. And uh, I really, really enjoy my job, especially the teaching aspect of it. So, uh, uh, Ashley, thanks for asking. Our next question is from Yash from Miss Barone's class. How far away do you have to be from a rocket when it's launched? Good question. The minimum safe distance is three miles away. And funny thing is NASA puts me three miles plus ten feet away. I actually do a live webcast from the launch pad for every launch. So watch for that on dln.nasa.gov. February 12th, we're sending two teachers in space on STS-119. You guys can actually email in questions live. Little warning, it's going to be early. It's going to be 7.36 a.m. Eastern Time. Ouch. What are some of the benefits of exploring space? That's a great question. In fact, that's a question commonly asked for, for cities that are not near a NASA center. Uh, because cities near NASA Center employ a lot of folks and so they don't even really ask. But there's a whole series of benefits of space called spin-offs. These were technologies developed for space which had commercial applications. And in fact, part of NASA's charter is to foster economic development. My favorite example are cordless drills. When the Apollo astronauts went to the moon and they needed to drill rock samples, there was nowhere to plug in a drill on the moon. So Black & Decker made the first cordless drills for the Apollo astronauts. And I just love having a cordless drill in my garage. But there are other examples, a lot of medical sensors, uh, solar panels, uh, kidney dialysis, uh, satellite television, the list goes on and on and on. It's so popular, it is an annual publication by NASA called Spinoffs. Great question. Our next question is from Ms. Vanetta's class. Why do you need special food in space and is it hard to eat? Well, Ms. Vanetta, I'm glad you asked. In fact, I have some prepared for you here, if you don't mind. Most of the food in space is what we call rehydratable. All the water has been taken out of it. Uh, this way it can be stored at room temperature. We don't have a freezer or a uh, refrigerator on the space uh, shuttle. Uh, and students don't think this looks very good. Uh, you can imagine what students think this looks like. Broccoli all gratin and potatoes all gratin. So that's rehydratable food. Students, uh, in fact, um, Samantha, have you ever had pudding in a cup? Yeah. Samantha, then you've had astronaut food because that's a technical term called thermostabilized, just canned food. Uh, so that's true. And uh, Joe, have you ever had peanuts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, what we call natural food form. Uh, it doesn't have to be rehydrated. can be stored in a flexible pouch, stored at room temperature. And the drink is in a special flexible pouch. It's not Tang. That's an urban legend. NASA didn't invent Tang. Uh, this is orange drink. It is uh, stored in a small pouch, and it has the powder inside. You will add water to the top, so rehydrate your beverage. Put a straw on it, and then it's kind of like drinking Capri Sun out of a package. Biggest challenge to eating in space is that things will float away from you. So the astronauts play a little game. They'll sometimes take the peanuts or M&Ms and toss them up in the air, and then they float around and try to catch them in their mouth. So it can be difficult, yet it can be fun. Great question. How long does it take to get into space for Mrs. Veneta and Miss Yulo's class? Really, it does not take long, even though this is the government. The space shuttle actually gets into space. It's done burning all its fuel in eight minutes. That's right, eight minutes at traveling 17,500 miles per hour, which is fast enough to get you from New Jersey to California in about 10 minutes. Good question. Um. What does water like? What does water look like when it floats in space or in the space station? One of my heroes at NASA, as far as an astronaut, is an astronaut named Don Pettit. Don Pettit was the science officer, actually, 
on uh, Expedition 6 on the International Space Station. And he had a little bit of free time. And in that free time, he would do these little science experiments that he just kind of dreamt up while on the station. He did it for kids. And so I wanted to show you a little bit of his because it does answer that question. And in fact, Don Pettit did fly again back just a couple of weeks ago on STS-126. He flew on the shuttle to the station. Now, he didn't stay on the space station. They landed back in California this past Sunday. But let me take a look. This is the voice of Don Pettit and some Saturday morning science. Making thin water films. For wet chemistry lab operations on space station, we need the equivalent of a zero gravity beaker. What we are using here is a four inch square Ziploc baggie, which makes a two dimensional beaker where the opening is a slit instead of a round surface. And you can squeeze the bag to open it up a bit so you can have access to the surface. The slit part of the opening allows surface tension forces to contain the liquid so it won't slosh out and it will be well behaved. Here we're taking a 50 millimeter wire loop and dipping it into the water in our two-dimensional beaker. Now this water is deionized water. It's the purest water we could find on space station. There is no added surfactant. In the process of pulling this wire loop out, you draw out a sheet or film of water not unlike what you would do on the ground with a soap film. This solution has no soap added to it. You can use service tension forces to... So, pretty cool, huh? Now, if you want to see the rest of that, I just pulled it off of YouTube. Uh, it's Saturday Morning Science of Science Officer Don Pettit. It's about a 47-minute video. We don't have that much time. Next question. Now a question from Quinn from Mrs. Barone's class. What it what does it feel like to move around on the moon with less gravity? Great question. Uh, in fact, on the moon, uh, the moon has about one-sixth of gravity of the Earth. So, in a sense, you feel like you weigh uh, six times less. So, in theory, one could jump six times higher. So, if you jump one foot here on Earth, which is pretty attainable by most people, you could jump six feet in the air on the moon. So, every one of us, even you, Joe, and Samantha, could actually dunk the basketball. That's right. Now, the astronauts found, because of that one-sixth gravity, it was difficult to walk like we normally do here on Earth, one foot in front of the other. So they found the easiest way to walk on the moon was what they called the bunny hop, which is kind of both feet together and hopping like this, like a bunny. That is a true story. Next question. Um, now, how much weight do you feel pushing on, on you when, when the space shuttle lifts off? That's a great question. Actually, a great way to pull it, put it because that is a great way to understand it. The thrust profile for the shuttle is you experience three Gs, or three times the normal force of gravity. So if you weigh 100 pounds on Earth as you're launching, it will feel like you weigh 300 pounds in your seat as it's pushing you back into it. So uh, it is kind of a rough ride. So another way of thinking of that, uh, if the shuttle astronauts actually launch on the back, Imagine uh, you weigh 100 pounds, somebody that weighs 200 pounds actually standing right in the middle of your chest. That's kind of what it feels like. Is it hot or cold in, in a spacesuit? Uh, in the spacesuit, it is maintained at a specific temperature, around 78 degrees for the astronauts. And that's tough to do because in the direct sunlight in space, it's hot. It's 250 degrees above zero. However, in the shade in space, you may be wondering where is there shade in space, well, behind the space shuttle, there's some shade. Behind the space station, you might get some shade. Or even on the shaded side of the Earth when it's nighttime. It's 250 degrees below zero at that particular point. So the spacesuit has to be able to withstand about a 500 degree swing in temperature in an instant. So it's a very sophisticated piece of equipment called the uh, EVA as uh, the extra, extra, extra vehicular activity and the EMU is the extra vehicular mobility unit. Good question. How much gas do you guys use to get into space? Great question. On the space shuttle itself, the external tank, which is the component in the middle, uses 500,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen. That's right. Liquid hydrogen is actually 423 degrees below zero. Joe, would you like to see something that cool right now? Yes. Joe, I have a yes. container of some liquid nitrogen. It's 320 degrees below zero. 
That's right. And 320 degrees below zero, a common question from students is what happens if you put your hand inside of there? I won't do that, but if I put a straw in, watch what it does to the straw. Now, listen very carefully, you let it freeze. So the straw freezes, and watch what happens to our poor straw. After just a few seconds inside of liquid nitrogen, it indeed will break into a bunch of pieces. Mm -hmm. That's right. So a half million gallons of liquid fuel, two million pounds of solid rocket fuel, generating four and a half million pounds of thrust at liftoff. That gives us that 3G profile. Good question. Thank you, Mr. Talley, for answering all of our questions and coming on our news program. We have to continue with the rest of our broadcast now. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. Thanks today. for all the questions. We'll continue with our broadcast. Feel free to stay connected if you want to watch. Today is Friday, December 5th, 2008. It is the day one. Our character education thought of the day is earn money for a young scholar's dad by doing chores around the house. And now for the weather brought to you by Weatherbug. Today is expected to be mostly sunny. The current temperature is 28 degrees Fahrenheit. The high is expected to be 38 degrees Fahrenheit. The lows this evening will be 19 degrees Fahrenheit. Tomorrow is expected to be partly sunny. There will be outdoor races today. Today's lunch will be Tony Smart Cheese Pizza. At this time, please stand for the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag. This is Sammy signing off. And Joe signing off. Be sure to tune in on Monday for another edition of VES News. Enjoy your weekend. Have, Have a, a fantastic, fantastic Friday. Friday.